Uh, hi there. Uh, welcome to Racket Fest. I, I want to tell you about a, a pretty deep rap, rabbit hole that I got into over the past, I don't know, many, many years, maybe maybe more than 20 years. Uh, and it started in 1999, uh, you know, at the University of Tübingen when I was teaching introductory um, computer science and introductory programming. And, you know, this video is from, I think, 2008 or nine, but I, we actually you know, started doing this in 1999. And I've talked about this before. We, you know, uh, we were big fans of Scheme at the time because of this book, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. Great book, uses Scheme for teaching how to program, uh, has wonderful examples. Um, you know, it's, it's such a compelling book. We started teaching with it and we found out it didn't work, or at least it didn't work at, as well as we had hoped. And, uh, you know, this was 1999. Fortunately, you know, uh, two years later, um, you know, this book came out. Uh, how to design programs, and it not only showed that maybe how to, you know, structure and interpretation of computer programs wasn't the best book for for teaching, but it, you know, it it was com it made a compelling case that indeed, you know, this book, uh, you know, had the methodology and and was the way to go um, uh, with teaching, and it came kind of with you know three components, right? One of them was of course the the unique pedagogy uh, that we've come to to love since then in how to design programs, but also um, it came with a Dr. Racket uh, programming environment, which was I was actually pretty familiar with, and it came with its own set of uh, programming languages. So in those teaching languages, they're still there. So you know I've opened up a copy of Dr. Racket over there. So, uh, well, there it is. And uh, well, we're used to selecting a language that a file is written in with the hash lang directive, but we can also go to the language menu, click choose language, and up here we're in what's called the racket language, or the, the one where every file is marked with a hash lang, but there's also teaching languages. And specifically, here's the book, right? How to design programs. And here's beginning student, for example, and we can click on that. And then we need to get rid of the hash lang that no longer works. Uh, click run. And then we see beginning student uh, pop up down here. Now, uh, you know, I think the most immediately visible difference between the teaching languages and the regular racket language is that uh, not everything is there. So we could do this. Um, there we go. You know, set bang, uh, run that program, and it tells us that set bang this function is not defined. It's not in the teaching language. Why is that? Well. You know, when you start teaching an introductory course, often the students will come in with some background in Java or C or C++ or something, or Python or something like that. And uh, uh, of course, you know, they're used to programming with assignments all day long. Um, and so the first thing that they do is when you start teaching them how to program in Racket is they look up in the manual how to do assignments and then use that. And of course, you know, being good functional programmers, we don't want them to do that. And so the easiest way to do that is just to exclude those elements from the language. Another even better motivation is that, you know, with the, when the language is restricted, we can provide better error messages because people sometimes stray into language territory that hasn't, um, hasn't been covered in class yet. So. Uh, and, and lots of other little motivations where maybe we can make some programming elements better uh, because of the teaching languages um, and so on. So, you know, you know, having seen that and, and, you know, making the same observations with our students in class, we kind of grudgingly agreed, yes, indeed, you know, doing our own teaching languages is maybe a good idea or, or doing specific teaching languages may be a good idea. Unfortunately, well, you know, looking back, uh, there's two sides to it, as you'll see. Um, you know, we didn't buy into the idea of just adopting the how to design programs programming languages, and instead we decided we were going to do our own. And I don't even remember the exact reasons. Uh, you know, it was probably a mixture of not invented here and the fact that we really wanted languages that were a little bit closer to Scheme, which uh, you know I was really fond of uh, back in the day. However, there was one aspect of the how to design programs teaching languages that I genuinely disliked. And uh, well, you can see it here. This is an actual section from uh, how to design programs. And you can see here, uh, you know, parts of the design recipe where, you know, it says here there's a short description. Here's a template for, for the function. And here, this thing at the top that you see here, well, let me mark it out, is called uh, the signature. It used to be called a contract. Uh, you can see that it kind of looks like a type signature, uh, so it describes, uh, you know, how many arguments and what uh, what kind of data goes into the function, what kind of data comes out. But of course, there's a semicolon, and um, in, in, there's a semicolon at the beginning of the line, so it's only a comment, right? 
And so signatures are a crucial part of the design recipe because they then steer uh, the other steps of filling in the actual function definition. Uh, but, but they're just a comment. And the observation that we made with our students is that while well, students were fully aware that they're only a comment and that they weren't really being processed by the programming language, and so they were being very sloppy uh, with those signatures. And so we strove to, uh, to somehow fix that problem, address that problem, and we, so we thought about, well, how can we make this not a comment? How can we uh, somehow get better uh, about enforcing, uh, about pay, uh, encouraging, hopefully, students to write uh, better signatures? Uh, so I'll show you how that turned out because uh, you can actually, well, if you look closely, you can see the results of that today. So we're in the beginning student language uh, of how to design programs. And I've just copied that fragment from uh, the book into the buffer. And so I can do this, right? I can remove the semicolon and I can say, well, how many is the name of the function? And I can say it's a function. It takes a list of strings, so written like this, and a number. And so, of course, I need to add a bunch of parentheses. Uh, however, I need to do one more thing. I also, this, you know, what I'm showing here here is not available in the beginner's uh, language, but it is available in the advanced level of the how to design programs languages. So I'm just going to switch to advanced students here. You can't see me do that, but I'm doing that in the background. And if I now push run, you know, it says, oh, everything is OK. And in fact, you know, if we actually went in and said, um, you know, did this, um, well, you can see the function doesn't do anything, but um, you know I could put I could make a mistake here, and then I could say how many uh, uh, of empty something like this. I could run that program, and you can see here that the signatures. I mean, they're not just is the notation checked, but also while the program runs, uh, there's signature checking going on, and you get uh, an error message if uh, a signature is violated, a so-called signature violation and you can see here oh yeah well somebody passed you know somebody passed boo and these things down here are clickable links so i can see well this expression caused a problem this signature here got violated the number signature and well who's to blame it's this particular function or procedure so um, you know that's what we did and it turned into a paper let me switch to that hopefully you can see it here well turned into a paper that we published at ICFP 2010. So this was already quite a few years ago. And uh, well, we first did it for our own teaching languages. And only when we'd done that and published a paper, uh, various people approached us who were teaching uh, using how to design programs. And they said, well, wouldn't it be nice if we also had signatures in the how to design programming program languages? Um, and uh, so, so we've been trying to make that work ever since. So what happened was that pretty soon after ICFP, uh, we integrated signatures into the HTTP languages, but we faced one problem, and that had to do with structs, right? In the HTTP languages, you can make something like this, right? You can uh, uh, you can make um, a struct um, like this one. And the question is then, well, how do you integrate that with signatures? In particular, when you write, uh, for example, a signature for you know, make pair, the constructor of this, right? You might say, um, you might say something like, well, we're going to make a pair of two numbers, but uh, what do you put here, right? And, well, it seemed natural that you would use the name of the struct type as the signature for the struct value, so you would write it like this. So that's what we did at the time, and the problem now was that people would sometimes accidentally type pair into the REPL, and then it would say signature. And, uh, well, this was all good and well if you knew what signatures were, but if you didn't, uh, that was confusing to some of the students. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things that I mentioned earlier is you would, you know, students would then, that would mean that they would accidentally stray into a part of the language that they didn't know about or didn't know about yet. And so for years that issue kind of lingered because we didn't know how to, um, how to make that work and how to integrate, um, you know, struct signatures in such a way uh, that it would not confuse the old time users or those that were in courses where signatures weren't covered at all. So it was until, you know, it took until ICFP 2019 uh, that uh, I think Matthias Felleisen and I sat down to have a discussion on how to fix that problem uh, when we came up at least with a first idea for a solution, namely that we would just use capital letters um, for uh, the struct signatures. And you can see here that that turned into a pull request. And that pull request has actually been merged and it is in the current version of um, Dr. Racket. Um, 
and but you, you know that that pull request well it it came in uh, well it was merged in 2020 uh, I'd authored it over a year before so it lingered for quite a while and you know the reason why it lingered and I hope I can find that is that um, yeah I think Matthias called me and said well all you have to do is write a bunch of tests right and this uh, so this is uh, this is where that kind of stopped in its tracks right because I didn't know how to test this and the reason for that is well if we switch back for a moment into Dr. Racket you can see here that the signature violations are displayed um, you know you can see here this program must be tested they're displayed along with the reports from the test cases in the teaching languages in order so I in order to make the signatures testable I really needed to make what's called the test engine the testing infrastructure but behind the teaching languages I needed to make that testable and that's and I didn't know it, but you know, I started thinking about that, and this is where the rabbit hole showed up that I was about to go into. So, uh, as it turned out, you know, well, why is it a rabbit hole, right? And it turned out there was another entrance to that rabbit hole that I haven't talked about yet. And well, you, well, here, you know, we chose the the language from the language menu, right? And we all know that usually we use hashlang to do that. And you might have also noticed that there's a button here, check syntax. And well, what it does is it makes you know various uh, arrows here appear. So for example, how many? So it makes these arrows. And you might have said, you might say, well, wait a minute. I see these arrows all the time when I use hash lang, and I don't need to push the stupid check syntax button. And that's because the ha the IDE for the hash lang languages has progressed beyond what is available to the teaching languages. And so you know, it's 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 been a long held wish of Matthias and me and lots of other people that really you should be able to switch to the to the hash lang language. Language. So I'm going to do that in the background now, and uh, so and just write, you know, a hash lang line here, and uh, so for example here, advanced uh, student language is that that's what it means, you know, run that, and uh, well you can see that it's slightly different, right? It displays its output in the REPL and not in that special test engine window because that test engine window really is tied to the uh, to the infrastructure to the old infrastructure for the teaching languages but you know at least um, it works to some extent right the links work um, and so on but uh, you know these these hash lang languages they've been avail uh, they've been available for a long time but you know you might have noticed that even here I have for example a check syntax button and I, there's also a stepper button but if I push that stepper button well give me a moment to switch the display so okay so I've got it over here so you can see what happens well when I push the stepper button nothing happens right steppers never worked uh, in hash lang mode uh, moreover you know the check syntax button actually well oh popped up on another screen uh, gives me an internal arrow and it's been like that forever right um, and so you know the hash lang languages have uh, you know have never been fully functional moreover I mean you can see some progress however because if you switch to uh, Dr. Racket a previous version of Dr. Racket so here's uh, Dr. Racket 7.8 let me switch to that um, and I copy that program in there um, so let's do that so here's just the code that you just saw right and I could push the run button here uh, well oh signatures don't work at all okay so we can comment that out um, and but we could we could make a failing test case right we could say check expect you know how many empty should have uh, should have something like this should be zero right and then I get um, get this right I get this uh, test engine output actual value differs from expected value well it you can already see that it doesn't look as fancy as it does in the new version and moreover down here it displays a location but that location is not clickable and so that made the test engine basically uh, uh, unusable at the time right and so we've made some progress in version 8.0 and I'm going to tell you about how that progress was made um, but uh, you know it was so so it was, it was desirable to make the hash lang languages work um, but obviously something needed to happen and there was a reason why it had not happened in the years prior to so at this point I really needed to kind of write down what the rabbit hole was right I realized that there, I was in the middle of one so I guess the the first point the first starting point was well I needed to make the test engine testable right the second point was well I wanted to make test engine output uh, in the REPL work 
specifically I wanted uh, links to be clickable. And I think, you know, at, at this point I was like, well, really, really, really we should generally make hash lang work so we can benefit from improvements in the general Dr. Racket uh, IDE in uh, the teaching languages. So we really wanted, you know, this stuff and also uh, the languages that we have uh, for Dyne program. Uh, you know, we wanted those, those should work, right? Um, so, you know, these things all come together kind of at the test engine. So that's what I was looking at at the time. And, you know, I quickly realized that indeed I was in the middle of a rabbit hole. And here's, for example, some of that code. Uh, well, you already see that it goes quite far to the right. So here is a central um, a central macro or actually a macro helper function uh, called check expect maker. And um, that is responsible for defining the various um, the various testing forms that are available in the teaching languages. And if you look closely, you can see, well, it, it talks to the stepper, for example. So we need to make sure that the stepper identifies the sub-expressions of the testing form correctly. Um, and you can see that, you know, it's pervasive, right? There's all these stepper annotations, and they're quite specific to the way that the syntax is being constructed. And so, uh, you know, I was looking at that, and, uh, you know, I was pulling on that thread, and more and more came out. And, you know, I talked to Matthias and he said, well, I also tried to rewrite the test engine, but I always failed because I changed, tried to change this code and I couldn't. Whenever I tried to change any detail of it, um, this was, this would break in some way. Um, and so I realized it was, it was going to be quite difficult. You know, here you can see kind of sort of manual navigation at a long comment that says, you know, how that uh, form is constructed. And it goes on like this. Um, and so that was the first sign that this was maybe going to be a harder project than I thought, but I figured, you know, I'm eventually going to get there. And I started rewriting. The second problem was, well, I wanted to get a uh, good output uh, even in the REPL, right? Uh, and specifically, I wanted links um, in the REPL. So, you know, digging into the code, again, this is the old code, it's no longer there. Uh, you know, I saw, I found this piece of code here, maybe I should make that a little larger, which says test display textual. And, you know, this was responsible for putting the output into the REPL, and it was purely a textual thing. You can see that it uses printf and so on. And uh, as opposed to the test display code in, in sort of UI mode, where it would pop up a separate panel or a separate window, where it would just use the editor infrastructure of the Mr. Ed framework uh, in order to make, uh, you know, a more elaborate uh, visual structure with boxes around the values that were wrong and also with clickable links. Right? And these two things were completely separate. And so I figured, well, I mean, the REPL internally in Dr. Racket, it's just an editor, right? I could just use this code, this code right here, um, and, you know, make it do what I want and just, just use that code on the editor provided by Dr. Racket. And, uh, well, I talked to Robbie about this and, uh, well, Robbie was very nice about it, but he informed me, well, you know, uh, do you, you know, I might have known because I was there for the early papers in Dr. Racket. Dr. Racket does pretty strict sandboxing um, uh, for its program. So you can't just have the program, even if it's via a library, uh, you know, put graphical objects into the Dr. Racket REPL because these objects might carry arbitrary code in the form of callbacks and these might compromise the integrity of Dr. Racket. And so, I was wondering, well, how is this going to work out? And again, you know, Robbie was very, Robbie Findler was very gracious in taking this on with me and, and going back and forth and trying, trying to solve this problem. So here's the idea that we came up with. So if you look down here, you can see that there's rudimentary formatting going on, right? Uh, so there's, there's a box around something, there's clickable links, there's things underneath each other, and there are things right next to each other. And um, so, you know, this idea applies whether you are in a graphical setting or in a textual setting. You could do the same thing in a textual setting as well. And so, whereas the previous testing engine had separate code paths, completely separate code paths to print into a textual format and into a graphical format, and these things would not always align, we figured uh, it would be nice to have a common representation of the idea of the layout, you know, what should be next to each other horizontally or vertically and what has boxes around them and where are source locations. And then in a separate step, we would, uh, we would render either to the REPL or to a textual uh, uh, to a textual shell or something like that. And here's what we came up with eventually. So there's now with uh, Racket 8.0, there is uh, 
a new package called Simple Tree Text Markup, clearly uh, a name that was designed by a committee. Um, and uh, what it lets you do is it lets you write things like this. So you can write vertical, you know, Mike, I could put Sperber underneath, and I could also embed, you know, this, this nest. So I could say, you know, frame markup, you know, my middle name, something like this. Um, 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 you know, even, even put, maybe, maybe make this vertical as well. I think you get the idea, right? Um, so, and well, if I run this, it's just a data structure, right? It's an inert data structure. And, uh, but what you can do with this is the port that is attached to the Dr. Racket REPL this, um, supports a special procedure called write special. So any port can do that, but they do it in different ways and they accept different kinds of objects, but the Dr. REPL port accepts these markup objects and then renders them in this way that you see here. And that is enough to get the test engine going. So right now the test engine just generates markup for all the test engine out output. And then depending on where that output goes, whether it goes to the REPL or the separate test engine window, it will uh, generate the appropriate output. It even works uh, uh, also, of course, in um, the textual REPL. So, um, I mean, this goes a long way already towards making, you know, the hash lang teaching languages work, but of course it doesn't go quite all the way. And so if we really uh, want to make them usable, remember, you know, the stepper doesn't work and the check syntax button doesn't work. Now, actually, the check making the check syntax button work is pretty easy and the current development version has that. Uh, so that's simply a bug. But with the stepper, it's more complicated in order to understand why that is the case. Uh, if you're ready to follow me into that rabbit hole, well, you have to understand that the teaching languages, they're implement most of the implementation uh, the front-end implementation is in a file called httplangs.racket, uh, so I've got that right here, and it's a long and complicated file. It manages all the various language settings, so you, it's not just about choosing a language, but you can also choose the output format, for example, uh, so that's going to become import, important later. Uh, so it goes on and on and on, uh, and in particular, you can see here that there's things like set printing parameters, which uh, you know has to do with actually rendering values and so on, and uh, you know it goes goes on like this. So here, for example, it's a function called teaching language render value um, a format that is responsible for actually correctly rendering values. And well, if you know the teaching languages, you know that they print values in a slightly idiosyncratic format. Uh, that's good for beginners. And the Dyn program languages also use their own format. So this is where the logic for that resides. That decides how that printing should work, and it also needs to be sensitive to various settings. Now you know this is all the functionality that's attached to the menu-based teaching languages, so it's not available in the hashlang languages. Um, and so in order, so, so you know, here, for example, is a function that renders a value, uh, so it prints that value. And, you know, that you can imagine that that goes into uh, various places. It doesn't just go into the REPL. It also goes into when there's an, uh, a test failure. Uh, it, it also goes into the report that says, I expected this value, so it needs to render the value there, um, uh, but I got this value, renders the value there. And it's also crucial in rendering values inside the stepper. And now this functionality is no longer there. So in order to make it available to the stepper in the hashlang languages, well, what do you do? You could pull it into its own separate library, um, um, but uh, or, well, or you just replicate it, right? And if you look in the current source code, you will see that there's just a duplicate of that source code specifically for the stepper. You can see here render to sex and that there is then also render value function, set printing parameters. And this is all stuff that's been copied from how to design uh, how to, from, from HTTP langs dot uh, RKT. So it's not pretty at this point. Why not just move it into a separate library? Well, the point is that um, you know, the implementation infrastructure for the hash languages, it can't know about Dr. Racket because you can use them also from the textual REPL, right? So it doesn't know that Dr. Racket is there, but quite a bit of the render uh, of the render value functionality is specific to Dr. Racket in the way that it prints images and, you know, puts the frames around and things like that. So you really want to make the Inside Dr. Racket, you want to be able to make use of the of the Dr. Racket functionality, and well, outside you can't. But that means you can't move it into a common library because all of Dr. Racket is sandboxed into a bunch of uh, units that you can't even access as uh, regular mod modules. And so that's what we are currently working on. 
um, uh, you know, trying to make render value work. And, you know, it seems like a trivial undertaking, but it's been going on for several weeks. Um, and that means that we really need to use, you know, rendering functionality that then, you know, Dr. Racket hooks into and provides its own printing uh, routines. And, you know, these things are already there. Uh, it just turns out that in Dr. Racket, they're attached to something called the global print handler that you see, the global port print handler that you can see here. Uh, so that's what we're currently trying to make work. And, but there's, uh, you know, this very trivial problem, you might think, namely the fact that uh, when you print a value inside, you know, a box in the test engine, you don't want it to go all the way to the right. You want it to be distributed over several lines. Um, uh, so you get a nice layout for that. And unfortunately, the global port print handler does not allow you to specify a printing width, even though, you know, Dr. Racket gives you the ability to specify one with a parameter. But the parameter is also set by Dr. Racket itself in certain situations. And so that rabbit hole is getting deeper and deeper um, currently, and, and Robbie and I are trying to figure out a solution for that. So it turns out in order to make, you know, surface functionality work in uh, the teaching language, in the hash lang languages, uh, we need to consider um, lots of parts of the infrastructure. And I haven't talked about, you know, how to make, for example, the uh, the links work in, uh, in 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 Dr. Racket to make them clickable without endangering uh, the security model, because of course these links also represent some kind of callback. So that there's also a lesson to be learned there. So it's been very valuable for me to learn uh, that uh, yeah, well, Dr. Racket has this really nice security model. We don't want to break it. Um, but it, it also means that we sometimes need to go some roundabout ways in order to connect uh, the teaching language uh, implementation uh, with Dr. Racket itself. So let's uh, retread our steps here into the rabbit hole, right? Uh, I think we're going to switch back here uh, and try to write this down. So originally, my motivation is to get signatures into the HTTP languages. and. They're partly there, not quite, but I think the remaining steps hopefully uh, will happen in the near future with the next one or two versions of uh, Dr. Racket. And that's already a journey that's taken uh, more than 10 years. But in order to even you know, get there, I needed to make the test engine testable. And that required essentially a rewrite of the test engine. While I was doing the rewrite, I figured we might as well more make the test engine also work with hashlang. So hashlang plus test engine, and that required rethinking the way that uh, test engine prints its output, because it, when it prints its output in hashlang, it needs to print to the REPL, and we didn't have clickable links in the REPL. And so that led to simple tree text markup and the rendering support for that in Dr. Racket, which has arrived now in version 8.0. Now, even with that, right, the, the hashlang languages are borderline workable, but they still lack a workable, a working stepper, still uh, lack a working check syntax button as well. So I really wanted a workable stepper as well. And this led to the problem that the stepper needs to have access to value rendering. And the problem is that when we're in Dr. Racket, we want to make use of Dr. Racket's value rendering, and only when Dr. Racket is not there, we can't do that. Um, uh, but this tends to be tricky, and so that means we need to use standard, uh, need to use standard functions uh, for for value rendering. And uh, you know that function is uh, global port print handler <laughs> at the moment, so that's where we are currently. But uh, we need to have um, you know pretty printing for that, and we don't quite know how to do that yet in a way that will not negatively affect affect the functionality that's already in Dr. Racket. And hopefully, you know, once you know, once we're going to be done with that, we're going to be able to come out of that rabbit hole again and then finally sort of look at what we've done, what we've done and consider uh, ways to really improve the IDE and make it more usable specifically for beginners and that's what I'm looking forward to. It's hopefully just going to be a couple more months in the lockdown, uh, and you know, if you're interested in helping or generally interested in what you know what's what's going on there, uh, feel free to get in touch with me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Racket Fest.